Well, I think we're going to begin. Welcome, everybody. Good morning and good afternoon to our comrades joining from South Africa today. Thank you all for being here and welcome to the second installment of our Thinking Freedom from the Global South speaker series. I am Irene Kalis in American University's Department of Critical Race, Gender and Culture Studies, where I am so fortunate to be part of a collaborative of visionary and deeply humane colleagues and partners. The title of today's event is The Power of Abakhleli and the Living Politic Has Been Paid in Blood, featuring, featuring two esteemed speakers, Zbu Zekode and Nigel Gibson, who will be introduced shortly. It is truly a great honor indeed that you both are with us and here together. The Thinking Freedom series is a collaborative initiative co-sponsored by my own department, the Anti-Racism Center and the Women's Initiative of AU's student government. I wish especially to thank Malini Ranganathan, Eileen Finley, Chelsea Anderson, Dylan Singleton, and Monica Moran for helping to make this initiative a reality. A few brief announcements before we begin. Uh, this event is happening via Zoom webinar, which means, as you likely know, that the audience's voice and audio are automatically turned off. Uh, you will be able to interact with panelists via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screens. And I want to encourage, in particular, students to submit your questions and identify yourself as such, if that feels OK to you. Live captioning will be available throughout the event, and please access this service by clicking on the CC closed captioning icon in your toolbar. And finally, the event is being recorded and will be available for viewing and sharing in a few days. The Thinking Freedom from the Global South series, which grows out of a course with the same name I'm offering this semester, centers the question of human freedom from the perspective of history's underside, or in Fanonian terms, the damned of the earth. Each speaker is engaged in radical intervention across different emancipatory and anti-colonial struggles, and will consider how grassroots intellectual activists are thinking about and forging alternative futures. Despite their different contexts and experiences, these communities share a common struggle for land as the basis of life, for human dignity, and the belief that another world is possible, and in fact is necessary and urgent. Human dignity is not the language of the state, of humanitarianism, indeed of the status quo. How does centering human dignity within one's understanding of freedom reframe the demands of the present, our vision of the future, and the methods we use to get there? In defying the logic of racial capitalism, a call for human dignity is a revolutionary act it is a conscious effort to reclaim the wretched of the earth from what Cameroonian theorist Achille Mbembe describes as a history of black and brown life being turned into waste. The language and focus of our activism today often tells us what we are against. It is, an, it is in fact quite easy to be against something, against oppression, anti-racist, to work to dismantle. But what are we for? What are we proposing as alternatives? That's what this series is trying to explore. The betrayal of the anti-colonial struggle in South Africa, the dreams deferred in the post-apartheid moment today for many, bring into stark relief the importance of knowing what we are for. It tells us that, we, that if we hope to avoid reproducing what we are against, then our vision of an alternative must be clear and our methods, our ethics of struggle intentional. As both our speakers also remind us, the basis of our thinking about the future 
is located in the everyday heroes living their struggles. Today's event brings into conversation two remarkable figures in this regard, steadfast comrades and intellectuals of emancipatory struggle. Our featured speaker joining us today from South Africa is Sabu Sekode, founding president of the South African Abakhleli Basemonjondolo Shack Dwellers Movement. For many, a beloved leader whose unwavering vision and commitment to human dignity, to democratic power, has also come with great cost. Sabu is joined by Professor Nigel Gibson, Associate Professor of Postcolonial Studies at Emerson College, and I would add a vital, lucid voice within emancipatory politics, whose interventions greatly inspire my own. Sabu and Nigel, we receive you here with warmth and deep appreciation for this encounter you make possible, especially in my mind for our students, for our future visionaries, many who are weary and harmed by the continual deference to Eurocentric ideas, ways of being and doing. Those who feel the alienation and violence of white settler spaces, including American University that sits on Piscataway lands. In the final pages of The Wretched of the Earth, Fanon calls upon us to come up with new concepts if we are to reimagine and truly humanize the future. I hear this call echoed in our students and this series is a response to that call. So thank you so much to our guests for being with us here. Before we begin, I wish to just take a moment to also acknowledge those loved ones who are no longer here, who are part of our struggle. We honor the grief of their loss as well as the love it reflects. We ask that our ancestors hold them until we meet again. And so it is my deep privilege to welcome our first speaker today, Professor Nigel Gibson. Nigel is recognized as one of the leading scholars of Frantz Fanon. He is the author of numerous influential works, including Fanonian Practices in South Africa, from Steve Biko to Abakhleli Basse Monjondolo, and Fanon, the Postcolonial Imagination, which won the Caribbean Philosophy Association Prize, and co-author of Franz Fanon, Psychiatry and Politics. He is the editor of Rethinking Fanon, Challenging Hegemony, Social Movements, and the Quest for a New Humanism in Post-Apartheid South Africa, and Living Fanon and co-editor of Contested Terrains, Contemporary Africa in Focus, Adorno, a critical reader, and Biko Lives. He is currently the editor of the Journal of Asian and African Studies and is completing his forthcoming volume, Fanon Today, The Revolt and Reason of the, for the, of the Wretched of the Earth, which commemorates the 60th anniversary of Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth. Please join me in welcoming Nigel Gibson, who will then introduce our featured speaker, Sabu Sekode. After this event, Nigel will be holding a workshop for AU students on the works of theorist and revolutionary Franz Fanon. Welcome, Nigel. I'm so grateful that you both are here. Thank you. Thank you, Irene, uh, for that uh, wonderful introduction and also a description of um, your important course that this is part of. I'm going to, um, my role here is to introduce Fu um, and then play a, play a role in, um, in, in the questions. Um, so first, let, let me introduce uh, Fu Sakode. who I am incredibly honored to be introducing. 10 years after the formal end of apartheid in 1994, South Africa was no longer the hope of those early years. And Abathlali Basmanjondolo's emergence in 2005 was directly connected to its broken promises. 
Abathalali Basmonjundolo is Izi Zulu for people who live in shacks. The movement emerged slowly across the shack settlements in Durban and then beyond, based on principles of grassroots democracy, direct action and discussion. It is remarkable that it has survived 15 years of police violence, state repression and murder. This violence was there from the beginning and was especially politically organized after the organization was instrumental in defeating the provisional government slums bill at the constitutional court in 2009. Thereafter, it was subject to enormous violent repression organized by the ruling party, the ANC. Abathlali was pathologized as anti-development. Since they did, not, they did not want to move out of the city with its access to schools and hospitals and some work, and ra rather than move to government tin shacks in peri-urban spaces. And also at the same time, it was criminalized. It was forced underground after this repression in 2009 and then blamed for the violence by the ANC regional leadership. Its members were arrested for murder and suffered a year in jail and then eventually freed with the police case unilaterally being thrown out of court. No longer the promise of 1994, South Africa today has the same structural inequalities of apartheid in tr newly entrenched by a, a party kleptocracy becoming more and more brazenly gangsterist. Subject to continual repression, the murder of activists and threats on Sue Sabogi's life continued. Through this, Abbas Lali not only survived but thrived and has now become the largest social movement in South Africa and has done so adhering to its principles of inclusivity, openness, and a living politics in, co in contrast to the daily politic of death, the subject of today's talk. I was, all I was already lucky to have contact with Spu when Abbas Lali was born through comrades in South Africa at the time, Richard Pithouse and Raj Patel, who were in Durban. And I first met Spu and others soon after. Spu was elected to be the founding president of the organization, which now has a Facebook group you can join and a website that contains an archive of all of its history, its press statements, its analyses, including talks that SPU has delivered nationally and internationally. My own interest in South African liberation and especially to uh, Biko's Black Consciousness Movement, which led me to France Fanon in 1980, became an important way for me to analyze and understand what was happening in South Africa on, in 1994. In my book, Fanonian Practices in South Africa from Steve Biko to Abathlali Basmanjondolo, published 10 years ago, I gave three examples of what I considered Fanonian praxis. Biko's engagement with Fanon and the development of the Black Consciousness Movement, a Fanonian critique of post-apartheid South Africa, especially through reading The Wretched of the Earth, and an engagement with Abathlali Basmanjondolo as what Fanon might call the truth of the nation. For me, the idea of Fanonian praxis is not at all limited to South Africa. This was simply one expression of a world concept, emphasizing the praxis of engaging and using Fanon in different locations. Another example might be James Saki Sales' remarkable meditations on Franz Fanon's Wretched of the Earth, produced as a reader's guide for the study of Fanon within the prison system in the US. And a third might be 
the new explorations of Fanon in Brazil by intellectuals, as well as by those activists engaged in the indigenous people's struggle against land and river, river expropriation in the Amazon. However, the whole idea of Fanonian practices in South Africa was only realizable through the emergence of Abathlali Basmanjundolo, and Spu graciously agreed to write the preface to that book. In post-apartheid South Africa, which where inequalities remain stark, the shack dwellers are often ignored and thus need to make themselves heard. After 1994, the ANC made promises while new struggle language of government formed a screen to deflect criticism. The shack dwellers and the poor were excluded from discussions about, about what a post-apartheid society might be. And they remained outside of all the discussion about quote unquote civil society. They were simply a vote bank assumed to be loyal subjects of the ANC. In my mind, Abathlali Basmanjandolo was not only a challenge to local ANC politicians, but expressed the concreteness and rationality of the revolt, as Fanon puts it in The Wretched of the Earth. They demanded the government and its bureaucrats talk to them, not about them. When it came to the question of electricity cutoffs, to the lack of amenities, to the lack of water and toilets, to fires in the settlements, to the allocation of houses, they demanded to be listened to and taken seriously. As they put it, they were the professors of the poor in the school of the struggle, a struggle that is continually, continually teaching them truths. As the movement argues, quote, our suffering became a way for the people in the ruling party to become rich. Abathlali also developed an inclusive notion of living learning and challenged university intellectuals to visit them in their spaces, in the university of the shacks. And from its beginning, the movement rejected the idea that land should be turned into a commodity, arguing that land should be distributed on the basis, on the basis of human need. They speak of the need for grassroots urban planning and for bottom-up and de democratic management of the land. And since their birth, and often alone, they have taken stands against xenophobia and violence with a simple slogan, no human being is illegal. The mandate and the message of Abath Lali, Spu Sakodi said recently to a meeting of Abath Lali activists is, quote, to go out and humanize the world. Abath Lali Basmanjondolo is an internationalist movement articulating a politics of solidarity. And I was fortunate enough to visit them in March, just before the lockdown, March last year, when we took part in a roundtable discussion on Fanon. The question of the decolonization of land came up again as we discussed Fan's, Fanon's suggestion in The Wretched of the Earth that it was necessary to rethink everything. From its birth, the movement has called for the right to well-located land and decent housing for all in the cities and in their first legal march in 2005, they called for the expropriation of land from below. And indeed, they continue this fight against eviction from occupied land. On one of the land occupations at uh, Ikene, Inkenana, Kato Manor, they have created a space called the France Fanon Political School. And in our discussions in March, they linked Fanon to discussions that they had been involved in, including large num numbers of people about the constitution and the 18th amendment bill, which is called as the expropriation of land without compensation. And they argue that expropriation of land, decolonization of land has to be considered decommodified because 
land should be owned not by individuals, which then can be sold, but should be governed by everyone in the community. This is the politics of life. Spoo, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, uh, Comrade Nigel for that uh, introduction. Um, thank you so much, um, Professor Irene, uh, for having me here. I do want to say that um, I am deeply honored um, to be invited into this space and do say that I carry the hearts and the loves of the shared dwellers members with me. And I do want to take also this moment and salute those who have suffered the injustices, not only in South Africa, but across across uh, the globe. Um, I do want to salute those who have passed away uh, in their efforts to humanize the, way, the world. We have lost 18 activists here in Abakladi, and I carry those hearts, I carry those courage with me as I speak to you this morning. So, May I first of all take this opportunity to thank the American University's Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center for giving Ambassadi this important opportunity to speak here today. The most powerful forces of oppression operate at a global level. And for this reason, the movements that organize resistance needs to connect with each other. Our movement is open to the world and we work to build solidarity with progressive forces everywhere. That is why today we speak with you here. I also want to acknowledge um, the audience uh, who have taken their time to listen, but also to participate in this uh, conversation. Students have often played an important role in the struggle and when university trained intellectuals are able to humble themselves and work with the oppressed people in the spirit of equality and mutual respect, they can play an important role in struggle too. Thanks to Professor Irene Kalis for your leadership and guidance and for making this discussion possible. I also appreciate this opportunity and I am honored because I am sharing it with a Bakhali scholar and a comrade, Professor Nigel Gibson, who has just introduced me today. For those of you who may not know Professor Gibson, he is not just a Fulham scholar, but also, was also graduated from the University of Abakhali Basandondolo with his book, Fanon Practice in South Africa, from Steve Biko to Abakali Basantondolo. It is always an honor uh, to share uh, such wonderful platforms with you because uh, we have so much to learn uh, from your work um, and from your, um, the fact that you, you are very humble um, and you are grounded and, and, and open to, you know, we work with activists on the ground that makes you um, one of us. Many academics start their work by assuming that impoverished Black people cannot think for, for ourselves and that it is their job to think for us, speak for us, and decide for us. Nigel always met us as equal. He understands that we can learn from him and that he can learn from us. This is why he is a comrade professor. Uh, there are very few comrade professors, so I'm sure there's so much that we can take from Comrade uh, Nigel. I also wish to thank Abakhali, the organization that has entrusted me with this responsibility as well. In our movement, all requests to speak at events like this are referred back to a democratic process before being accepted. No member of the movement represents themselves. We speak with the responsibility of carrying a mandate from a movement. 
These visual speakers raise thinking freedom from the global south is indeed pushing anti-colonial thought and practice. They are oppressed people everywhere, including the United States of America. They are oppressed people everywhere, including countries like South Africa, where I am speaking right now. It is our own elites that matter us when we organize with simple demand of being recognized as human beings. It is, the, it is the same in India, Brazil, Zimbabwe, and many countries. But as we all know, since the time of colonialism, the countries of global south have always been dominated by the north. There can be no future for humanity unless this is changed and a world of equality between countries and between people is built. Abakali Basem Jondolo is a radical mass democratic movement of the shack dwellers and other poor people in South Africa. The movement is led by shack dwellers themselves who have often been looked down upon. I remember when we first started, many people did not believe that the poor could think for themselves. They often referred to our movement as umli loama pepa meaning a fire of papers that will not last. Many of these people, even from the government, were also critical and ashamed of the name of our movement, which means residents of the sheds. They told us that it was ugly, and they even persuaded us to change it into some fancy English name that suggests that all African people in South Africa are liberated and enjoy their freedom. While in reality, millions of us are landless, homeless, living in deep poverty and excluded from official forms of decision-making. It was colonialism that made us landless, that commodified land and built segregated cities. It was colonialism that came with the idea that some people cannot think and that they do not count as human beings and that they can be repressed and subject to violence with impunity when they try to take their places as human beings. More than 25 years after the end of apartheid, we remain landless. We remain commodified and cities continue to be segregated to be separated. But now, on the basis of class, our humanity continues to be denied. Elites continue to think that we cannot think for ourselves and that they should think and speak for us. And when we, when we insist on our humanity, we continue to be subjected to violence, even to murder. Hence my topic. is really the power of Abashlani and the war of a living politics has been built and paid with our own blood. For all of this reason, our struggle is an anti-colonial struggle. The idea that our language and culture are primitive and should be replaced with what us seen as modern languages and practice, be rejected at all costs. Our movement is open to the world. We learn from comrades everywhere. We learn from the comrades in Brazil, from the Landless People's Movement. We learn from comrades in India, you know, from comrades in South America and elsewhere. We are currently pursuing a program of urban farming on occupied land. The seeds that we used to start this project came from the MST, that is the landless movement in Brazil. We see this as a beautiful thing, but we also use our own culture and history to build our movement. I will give you one example. In rural villages, there is often meetings in which man is allowed to make his point. That point is not always criticized, rather a different view will be raised by someone else. The man who raised the, 
the withdrawn pawns may not be offended by that. This means that there's no one that feels that their dignity has been compromised. Everyone is encouraged to speak and to participate. Through a slow discussion, a consensus will emerge about which ideas are best. Often what will emerge will be a mixture of different ideas or one idea will lead to another one so that in the end of the meeting comes to a, a consensus that has been worked out together. Whoever chairs the meeting facilitate the discussion and is bound to sum up what has been discussed and resolved. The role of the chairperson is not to decide for the people, but to support the process in which people think and decide together. In the villages, women may be sitting quietly and not say a word, but women often have the power to influence or send their opinion through their partners or male neighbors outside formal proceedings. This is to say that some men would have received briefing from women prior to getting into the meetings. If he did not raise the particular point he was briefed to raise, he is likely to receive criticism from that woman. So women do have some power to strategically influence the meeting behind the scenes. We use the same method in our movement with one major difference. The majority of our members are women and meetings are often run by women. In fact, when they are male leaders, they are chosen by women and they know that they are accountable to women. This example shows how our movement draws on our culture and history sometimes advance, advancing it's quite radical to build a movement, a movement that has survived for 15 years despite various serious repression. There are many other examples such as ways to welcome strangers and to resolve serious conflicts peacefully within our movement. One of the colonial ideas that we have to resist from many quarters in the, is the view that poor African people cannot think for themselves. We find this thinking in the ruling party and the state. It is very strong in the universities and in some NGOs, that is non-governmental organization or not-for-profits. <clears throat> there are a number of academics who call themselves socialists and are trusted by the left internationally to represent South Africa, who are deeply blinded by the idea that poor African cannot think for themselves. In fact, they have called the idea that we can think for ourselves romantic or even necrophilia. Some are so confident that they should be leaving the struggle of the oppressed they have sought to destroy our movement because we have insisted that we will take direction from our members and not from them. They have slandered us, published fraud in their journals, supported state propaganda against us, work with a front organization for intelligence services to attack us, and just like the state, use their money to bribe other oppressed people to attack us. They have often thought that they have a right to decide who should represent our movement and strikers internationally. They have content for our democratic structures and our own decision making. Abahani was formed in Durban in 2005. The movement was formed to fight for, protect, promote, and advance the interest and the dignity of the shack dwellers and the poor in South Africa. And to create a space for us to build our own democracy and power from below. It was formed after pr promises for development and engagements were made and after promises were broken. It was formed because the lies were put before the truth 
In the years before the movement was formed, many people, especially young people, had experience of serious police harassment and violence during their everyday lives. They were often insulted and assaulted for a number of people that formed our movement. It was this experience that led them to start to be critical of the new democracy. Later, there were threats of forced removals to human dumping grounds outside of our cities. The final betrayal that led to the formation of the movement was when a piece of land that had long been promised to the residents of the Kennedy Road informal settlements in Devon for housing was sold to a local businessman. We were told that the African National Congress, which is the ruling party here, was leading the revolution, but profit was put before human needs. The commercial value of land was put before its social value. The living conditions and shack settlements were and are life-threatening, as noted by the United Nations. There is hardly any water and sanitation in the informal settlement, in the slums, in these conditions. There's hardly any access to roads, no refuse collections, no electricity. People are burned to death in shark fires as they are forced to use candles to light and paraffin stoves to cook. The living conditions put us at all kinds of risk and diseases, especially tuberculosis and HIV. Our children continue to die from diarrhea. Today, we face a high risk from the COVID-19 pandemic. Politicians thought that they were owning us. Even today, when they speak about us, they refer to black impoverished people as our people. They decide for us. They go out to speak for us without us. They steal public funds at a huge scale. They have no sense of Ubuntu, that is humanism, and do not appreciate the deep responsibility of being trusted to the positions of power that the masses have given them. This is why when we started our movement, we insisted so strongly that we would think and decide for ourselves, that we would build our own autonomous and democratic power. This is why we have created our own philosophy and our politics. Later, we discovered that most NGOs also thought that they should own us, decide for us, and speak for us. Both the government and those NGOs, which I refer to them as a regressive forces, try to show us to the world as criminals. When we insist on our autonomy, it becomes clear that for elites in and out of the state, it was criminal for us to ask to be recognized as human beings and to insist on our own human dignity. After 25 years of democracy, shack dwellers still live in mud like pigs without access to basic services, such as water, electricity, and toilets. After 25 years, after the end of apartheid, what was supposed to become a rainbow nation witnessed regular xenophobia, violence against migrants and minority groups. After 25 years of democracy, there are more people living in sheds than before. The poor are poorer than before. And the police violence is just as bad as it, it was always. Our constitutional democracy is being undermined by some of those who claim to have fought for this democracy. Like in Zimbabwe, they wish to make democracy a ticket to reward only for those who claim to have been in the, in the Liberation Army. The same people who claim to have been in an army of liberation 
are attacking migrants in the streets, the very same migrants who have hosted them, the very migrants who have looked after them during those olden days, where is their Ubuntu? Where is their humanity? Our cities have been taken over by political mafias and gangster politicians in suits and ties. They dress so smart that you cannot see them. They are as smart as those that are highly educated, but inside are dirty of indignity. They have been prepared to kill in order to ascend to the positions of power. Some of them have blood on their hands, and that blood has actually became their ladder to ascend to these positions of power. They are not in power today because they are smart enough. They are in power today because they have power to kill people. A number of our leaders have been assassinated. Two ANC councillors, I mean the African National Congress, the ruling party in South Africa, two of their councillors in the city of Etegwini are in jail for killing our leader Tulindov. They are guilty as charged by the Durban High Court. The price for land, for decent housing, and the right to the city is paid in blood. I must repeat that. It is not that you have to be smart to pave a way for a, a more human world. The price for land, decent housing, and the right to the city is paid in blood. Brutal and unlawful evictions continue to terrorize our communities. The organized easing army, hitmen, the land invasion units of the Etewini municipality or city government of Durban, the red ends of the city of Johannesburg, and the anti-land invasion units of the municipality in the city of Cape Town have subverted the law and used violence on landless people. This is what happens when the commercial value of land is placed before its social value. This is what happens when an accountable political leadership is replaced by a gangster politician. This is what happens when a democratic state is replaced by a police state. So what we have discovered was that democracy achieved in 1994 was never for the impoverished people. The elites used the poor and the working class to win power. And they used us as their ladders to climb up and replace the old white oppressors. Democracy became an opportunity for the politicians and the elites to enrich themselves at the expense of millions of people of South Africa. The question of land, the question of the right to the city, and the question of building a participatory de democracy were never resolved. We were never allowed to participate in decision making since the onset of our democratic dispensation. We were never allowed to participate in decision making with regards to our lives and our own communities when we organized to insist on our right to participate in this democracy, we were presented as the third force, which means agents of foreign powers working with old apartheid forces. We were slandered and violently repressed by the state and the ruling party. Local politicians eventually became dangerous speakers in our communities. Today, people say, Sesi Awasaba Amakanzela meaning we are afraid of councillors. How does one become afraid of their own elected representatives? How in our own democracy, one is scared, becomes scared 
of the same people that they elect into power. Local councillors, mostly those from the ruling party, have become dangerous figures in our streets. The African National Congress has betrayed the struggle for liberation and become new oppressors. Now, new oppressors are dangerous. They can be very smart because they've learned from the best and they excel. This is what we are facing and this is what the ANC is doing currently. For many years, it was very difficult to get progressive people in other countries to understand this. Now, after the Margana massacre in 2012, and the huge theft when Jacob Zuma was president, everyone understands this very well. However, one thing to appreciate is that Abakhani communities have organized and built our own democracy from below. A democracy that recognizes every human being, a democracy that respects every human life, a democracy that encourages participation in decision making, a democracy that celebrates women's power and is committed to self management. This is what we call living politics. It is the politic of truth. It is the politic of principle and courage. It is the politic that is stored from the ground about the reality of our lives. This politic is still not found in big philosophical books of our time that Nigel Gibson and others reads. It is found and thought from the humility of ordinary men and women of our time. It is the politic of land, some refer to it as life and death. As we come from Mother Earth and shall be buried in the earth when we die. It is the politic that everyone can understand. It is the politic of decent housing for all, everywhere, including in the United States, including in the state of California, where I was once surprised to meet people sleeping on the street of California and the Bay Area. So there's homelessness everywhere, not only in the global south, in the global north, there's poverty. The very emerging voice of Abakhari in the global south has to emerge also in the global north so that the north and the south can meet in humility to humanize the world that needs to be humanized. Now this politic is found and thought from the humility of ordinary people. It is the politic of land. And of course, it is the politics that everyone understands. It is the politic of decent housing for all. It is the politic of good schools. It is the politic of good hospitals that heals. It's the politic of good libraries. It is the politics of good universities, tax, safe street, and decent income for all. It is the politic of water. Many of us live without sufficient water in sheds and in rural communities. If we are lucky to have one tap, we share it in our hundreds. Yet a middle class or rich person could have up to seven taps just in one house. We know water is a natural resource, but it is a gift from God. But now the politicians who want to make themselves as if they are gods decide who should get it and at what cost. Electricity is also commodified. Nigalonda Bangulu, one of the founders of Abakhlan, used to say that we do not need electricity and water, but our lives and, and but our lives need electricity and water. So those are different things. We do not just need water and electricity. But that's more than that. It is not us. It is our lives that needs water and sanitation and, and, and electricity. So there can be no compromise in that. That is why wherever we have no water, we connect water 
to ourselves, to ourselves. Where there is no electricity, we do the self-connection to electricity. Whether you call that theft or crime, you are blind because when these fundamental services are denied to people, you do not see that as, as theft. You do not see that as crime against humanity. Only when humanity do some criminality. So during these 15 years of forced struggle, the self-organization of impoverished communities has been seen as some form of conspiracy. This is done to justify violence on us. Sometimes we are accused of being funded by foreign agencies that aims to destabilize our hard-won democracy. This is also done to justify our violence on us. Organizing outside the ruling party and outside the state and NGOs has cost us lives. We lost 18 activists between 2009 and 2018. This is why our members started to say that they are in a situation in which they have to accept that their commitment is to the land of death. Many of us have scars just for insisting that impoverished people must count in our society. Although we have deep scars and remain marginalized, today we have a place called home because of our own courage and income, which is a kind of a strong determination. We have done this through occupying vacant and unused land. That is not crime. Crime is when there are, there's human being that, have, that does not have land, that does not have decent housing. That's time. Before you conclude to judge what, what constitutes criminality or not, you should start by saying, does every human being have to send home, have land, then everything falls into place. We have done this through occupying vacant and unused land. We have connected ourselves to water and electricity. We have built cooperatives and community gardens. We have built catches for our children and access roads to our settlements. This is called democratic urban planning from below. We are not going to wait for governments in order for our lives to change. We will do whatever it takes to make sure that our children are safe and they have a better future. What choices do you have when your own government has no time for its people? What choices do you have when your local city government or councillor has become dangerous figure to the same people that have elected them into the positions of power? What choices do we have when your local councillors spend their time chasing tenders and business deals? Today, we remain a people's movement and the largest to have emerged in post-apartheid South Africa. It is the democracy that we have built ourselves that has given hope to many people in South Africa and abroad. The power of Abashaj and our living politics has carried the values and the change of our democracy, and we work hard to build the future we want while we defend our gains. It is important to repeat that the power of Abakhali and the living politics has been paid in blood. 15 years of our revolutionary struggle has not been easy. We have scars in our bodies. We have scars in our own spirits. We are emotional. We've been through hell for insisting that we are human beings amongst human beings, that we love our country as we love humanity, that we love our world as we love every human life. So we've been guilty for showing this, not just for saying this. Ubushali is our philosophy. Not Abashali now, Ubushali. This is the philosophy of our movement, of our movement. It is our joy and our pride. That can be used to advance democracy, to defend the constitutional democracy that was won in 1994 against a criminal elite in the ruling party and the state. 
to deepen and expand that democracy. After 15 years of our struggle, we remain committed to building radical democracy from below. We remain committed to the principle that the wealth, the cities, and land must be shared. We remain committed to our right to participate in discussions and to make decisions in a way that is shaped. This is the mission that confronts our generation. Let us work together in our communities and across the world to humanize the world. I want to conclude Professor Irene, Comrade Nigel, the American University students, and everyone participating here. I want to use this quote that is closer to my heart by Franz Fanon. I quote, each generation must discover its mission, fulfill it or betray it. When these words are said, I can imagine at what stage Fanon was, but he was challenging the world and humanity that unless they rise, unless they speak truth to power in the face of serious repression, such as the one faced by Abathad, in the face of all kinds of the that humanity has to rise, no matter what the consequences are, Abakali has emerged. Abakali has discovered that mission. We are in a process to fulfill it or betray it. And each time I read this quote, I was also reminded when I was um, arrested and charged with seven fabricated charges, when I had to decide the whole night in the police cells, when I was, um, you know, um, when the police attacked me in the police cell, and, and when I was hit and refused medical attention, um, when I was tortured, um, I had to decide whether or not to continue leading this strategy of Abakla. When I appeared in court and saw the red t-shirts all over the courts and corridors of the courts, when I saw massive support of Abakla standing with me, immediately the answer came that it was worth continuing. So the scars that I carry today together with many comrades within Abaklan are the scars, the sacrifice, the offering to humanity, not only to Abaklan members, to the struggling human kinds all over the world whose mouth, mouth are shut, cannot say and express what they want to say. So it is the moment Abakali are discovering, but also fulfilling their mission. So there's a time in our life where, when we have to take decisions and these decisions are not easy. So our families have gone through difficult moments. Sometimes my kids have been without father. Sometimes there was a moment when I had to think about what is it that I, I have not achieved in life at a personal level. It was dead, it was unavoidable. I have seen death myself, but because time hasn't come, we have not fulfilled the mission we have discovered. So we have arisen to live, but to continue to struggle. I am inspired by the very same people that are claimed by many as uneducated, as unthinking, as 
you know, I get this power from these old women who cannot speak English. And that does, doesn't make them stupid. It doesn't make them. As people who cannot really pave their future. So I want to thank everyone that is participating here and say that, of course, I would be around for your questions and answers. As my comrade facilitate, I want to salute the American University, particularly the center and everyone that has put their efforts in co-hosting this. I hope people in the global south will take this opportunity as an opportunity really to advance all the challenges uh, that remain um, um, unresolved. Uh, but yeah, we have to meet uh, the global north some, somewhere. I thank you. Thank you so much, Stu. Um, a, a profound and also uh, clear presentation um, of of, of Avath Lali and its and its philosophy, which I think hopefully will will generate um, some questions, which which I will now um, I will now look for. Um, there's one. I've just got, I've got a I've got a. Do I just uh, answer live or do I read the question out first? I'm not sure. Okay, I'll read the question out first, them. and then um, and then and then uh, hit the answer live button. I assume. Um, there's one from Cornell who says, uh, "Dear comrade Spoo, how can white and middle class South Africans best support the movement for real democratic power from below?" Then there's uh, another one uh, from uh, Nicole Grossman, who asks, you mentioned that academia is implicit in reinforcing inequality. As a PhD student at AU, what advice would you provide to a budding researcher to limit these negative reinforcements, or even better, act actively reduce the inequality about which we write. Um, and let me just ask one third one so you could perhaps answer all three uh, and then we can wait for some more to arrive. Um, this one's from Janine Jones. Biko stated in an interview, quote, this is one country where it would be possible to create a capitalist black society. If whites were intelligent, if the nationalists would be very effective at an important stage, primarily because a hell of a lot of blacks here have got a bit of an education. I'm talking about comparatively speaking to the so-called rest of Africa and a hell of a lot of them could, com could complete, compete favorably with whites in the fields of industry, commerce, professions. And South Africa, could succeed to put across to the world a pretty convincing integrated picture with still 70% of the population being underdogs. But whites are terribly afraid of this. And here's the question. Did he describe a situation that has come to be? And although he may not have stated it as a prediction, understanding the structure he described, could the current situation post the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission be foreseen? Was there a kind of hope in 1994 that obscured Biko's <laughs> forecast? So um, I'm wondering, Spoo, whether you have um, any responses to the questions about what um, academics can do um, to critically engage what white and middle class, perhaps students can also do, um, and um, perhaps a reflection on, on, on Biko's um, quote unquote prediction. Yeah, uh, 
Thanks for that, Nigel, and thanks for the three questions. Um, I will begin with the Connell's one of what the white uh, middle class uh, activists or, 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 or academics you know, can do to support democracy from below. Um, the, the, my first advice would really be that you become a human being. Act with humility. Uh, I have learned one thing. Um, it's easy to be, you know, to think that one is educated when in fact they, they are not. Uh, sometimes uh, um, education is not measured by how many degrees one has, but uh, how one acts, you know, in fulfilling uh, those achievements. So my advice is that act with humility. The ideas that you bring in should be grounded and should be supported by, po by, po by popular masses on the ground. I always say that any great idea, if it's not supported and worn by the hearts of popular masses, is likely to fail, even if it's a great one. Hence, I'm saying you will need to, you know, to act with humility. You will have to be a comrade. In other words, um, you know, live with the comrades, uh, come at, uh, come to their level. And of course, uh, we would expect uh, that those who are good in writing, of course, to write uh, because um, the, 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 there's so much that we need to do to change the mindset of the people. So I would encourage people to keep writing. Um, you know, positive, positive, positive stuff that would actually help, you know, the general public to understand, or maybe to, because the, the notion of decolonization is not going to be uh, won uh, quite easily if the, the academics and scholars are not uh, doing enough um, in terms of their research, in terms of um, the work that they do in writing and, and, and influencing the thinking uh, to rethink uh, freedom, and which is uh, this session is about rethinking uh, freedom. So we would want to rely, you know, on, on people like this. So, so I would encourage people, therefore, to keep writing, you know, articles, to write books, to write um, um, newspaper articles in their own respect, uh, respective countries, but also in supporting of grassroots struggles like Kabashlali. In your respective countries, you would have to write to your 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 um, your, 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 your embassies, for instance, the South African High Commissioner in the US or anywhere in the country to raise uh, your, your 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 concerns. So for me, it's really simple. You should not keep quiet when things are going wrong. You've got to say, this is wrong. And when the inequality is encouraged, you've got to stand up with the little knowledge that you have. But the simple way to do that is to work with those who have already seen the light and support them with the little that you have. The second question and advice to, uh, oh, of course, and um, I, th I think I was jumping to, to the second question, to reduce inequality, obviously, um, we know of a lot of um, you know, academics that want to um, defend the status quo, that want to make sure that the status quo remains. But we also know that some of them are paid to do that. So we want the progressive academics to rise above those individuals who are undermining these hard end intellectual work to say that for the inequality to, to be reduced, we need, we need to think deeply and talk about this. We need to have an honest discussion and, and, and provide platforms you know, for, for this discussion to take place. And I'm glad that this university is doing that. We need to engage in this. We need to ask ourselves critical questions. Otherwise, the inequality will remain. And those who are full of fear to speak out, I think it is high time that they are courageous, they are encouraged, and they have courage to speak out against the injustices. So for me, it's really one is to have in Ghana these 
determination of speaking the truth to power. Uh, the, the last question also speaks about um, what our hope was in 1994. And of course, um, the role of the TRC, we must say that uh, we all had high hope and we thought that things were going to change easily. But of course, we knew that years of colonialism and apartheid were not going to be easily rooted out. We knew about this. Hence, we had our own role that we have played in supporting the government. We did not just become anti-governmental. We were there to support government by doing our parts to organize communities, to prepare ourselves for what we thought was going to be a democracy for all and freedom for all. We, we did our part, um, not only organize communities, but set up our um, projects in communities, such as your community gardens, such as your feeding schemes. We've registered an organization that are not for profit, but also educating our people that the dawn of democracy, uh, of course, is not just something that is going to be delivered. We knew that freedom was not going to be delivered uh, or brought in by a, you know, a helicopter. We knew that we had to work hard to do that. And in the spirit of what Nelson Mandela used to call rainbow nation, we thought there was a, you know, an opportunity for you know, the whites and, and blacks to really be honest about the reality and about real freedom. But of course, um, I think uh, Bigo was right. Uh, we are seeing now black elites uh, actually taking over uh, uh, from what the apartheid system was doing. And the lessons that we have learned now um, uh, is, is that it may not necessarily that white people oppress South Africans because they were white. It was not just a question of color. It meant there was something fundamentally wrong, something deep wrong in the thinking of the people. So the skin and the color may have played that role, but we are seeing the same thing today with black folks. They are actually excelling from what the apartheid uh, government will do. So when they see us, they see objects. When they see us, they see ladders, they see animals, but they see tools that they can use to ascend to the positions of power. When they meet us, they lie to us all the time. When they pretend to be doing something good for us, like building housing for us, in most cases, it is substandard. These houses are falling apart without any foundation. So I'm saying the apartheid of system was um, crime against humanity, yes. But the post-colonial actions of the current leadership is as guilty as crime against humanity as it were. So there's nothing better. So it means the work of the TRC did some work in terms of reconciliation. To be honest, there are South Africans who are really, who have really transformed and wanted to see good out of humanity, who want to see this unity, wanted to see this dream uh, of world class cities, of a country that could be, you know, an example to Africa and the world. But of course, the power of capitalism has hijacked the black intellectuals and politicians into doing exactly what the apartheid system did, but they excel now. Thank you, Smoo. Um, a couple, I think we can, we can engage a couple more questions. Um, I have one from um, Ken, Ken Edgar Salo, uh, who, who says, um, I'm a sojourner in the struggles for, for, for dignity of poor people and working with Cape Flats based housing assembly movements. And I would value your, your reflection on the promises and pitfalls of engaging South Africa's constitutional legal system in anti-eviction work, specifically under which conditions 
can legal petitions and legal language facilitate and frustrate your home languages of living politics? So do you want to take that one first? And, I'll, and if we've got time, we get to the second one. Yes, I, I just, just, just want to appreciate uh, to Ken uh, that he stroke she has worked uh, with the Housing Assembly in Cape Town. They are doing fantastic um, work, of course, to make sure that people are unarbitrarily evicted. So in terms of our legal system, uh, we must say that we appreciate that South Africa's constitution, uh, of course, is one of the best constitution in the world, uh, not because people say so. We've seen it. We've survived today because of the very same legal system that is there. Although we know that it is not always a terrain for poor people. It is expensive to have access there. Lawyers are expensive. Um, so it is not the terrain of the grassroots activists to have easy access there. But of, also the language that is spoken there, it is not our language. However, um, certain sections within the constitutions are very progressive and uh, such as uh, the right to housing, such as section 26 of the constitution um, is as progressive as the Brazilian constitution. It uh, guarantees the right to housing. But when the constitution guarantees the right to housing, it doesn't mean that activists and homeless people must fold their hands and think that the justice system will do wonders for them. The constitution is as a piece of paper as any other paper that is good when it is placed in the shafts which is why the organizing behind the very legal system is always necessary to rally around that, what we call movement lawyering. We are very lucky to be working with the Social Economic Rights Institute of South Africa here and to understand, you know, when you see this combination of social movement and activist lawyers, you know, working out these cases together, it makes uh, the, the work of activists um, very easy in terms of learning, understanding the legal system. But of course, I do want to say, while we appreciate uh, the, some pieces of legislation, uh, like the Housing Act in South Africa, we have that. But of course, uh, when there's no political will, it doesn't help if people are not organized enough if people are thought that their work can be replaced by lawyers, it doesn't help. Which is why we encourage Congress to rally behind lawyers. We must be present when the, the, the case is prepared. We must be part of drafting affidavit and, and, and uh, you know, the papers that will be going to court because we must learn in the process. We must know what that means and what would happen when we lose in court. So I want to explain a scenario where you can win in court, but actually lose the actual case. What is the point of having a court order or a, or a court interdict that prevents you from being arbitrarily evic ev evicted when in fact you remain homeless? Which is why we got to balance, we, we, we have to find balance be between our organizing work and of course, the, 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 the legal terrain. There has been a stages that we have won in court, but that winning means nothing when people remain homeless. In Etagwini, because the municipality has always violated the, 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 you know, the, the court orders. They have acted with impunity. They have not respected the orders that are made by court. So what do you do in that? So which is why it is important for Abashali to win in court, but also hold the political ground tight. Because at some stage, you can actually lose in court, but still hold on to the land. We've seen that happening. So it is important, therefore, to balance the, 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 the legal parts uh, of the struggle as we struggle both in courts and in the state. The, the last question has two parts. Um, it's from uh, Malini Rangan Nathan, Rangan Nathan. And the first part, and it's connected to a course that they're doing called environmental justice. 
Um, the first part is, has environmental justice ever been a framework that Abathlali deploys in its activism and in addition to housing justice? And the second part is, could you say a little bit more about what you've been doing on building transnational solidarity? The landless people's seed sharing example was very inspiring. Yes, um, fortunately, uh, Abathali is uh, conscious of the environmental justice struggle, so much so that we work with comrades uh, within the Poor People's, Poor People's Coalition. We have a coalition that is called Poor People's Coalition, which involves the street, street traders, the migrant uh, communities, but also the environmental uh, justice comrades who are really working close to the question of climate justice. And that's how we benefit, and that's how we expand our struggle, and that's how we collaborate in also in understanding uh, the climate uh, justice struggle. But also it is important uh, for us, um, although I must be honest that we have not really mastered that question, but we are conscious enough that without the environmental justice, uh, we, would, uh, uh, we are running um, at a risk of facing a catastrophe, a, you know, um, a human catastrophe. Uh, because we've seen floods uh, affect us direct uh, in, in shark settlements. We've seen shark fires. We've, sh we've seen wild um, fires, uh, you know, destroying, you know, the environment. But we've seen how big corporations are also playing their part in destroying the environment, not for the environment, but for us as part, you know, of the future. So um, working with comrades like Desmond Desai within the South Deben Community Environment uh, is such a, an honor for us in terms of slowly, slowly understanding this question of um, environmental justice. So it's something that is very important to Abakali and from time to time, we, 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 we take that slightly very seriously. It cannot be divorced. Our study is not really divorced from the strategy, from the environmental justice strategy. It is as important as the strategy for land and housing. Now, the transnational solidarity, I did allude a little in my talk that we are working with the landless people's movement of Brazil. A lot of commonality, a lot of exchange and sharing to a point that a seed of those learnings from the MST has been seen um, in a Kenana segment here in Devon um, of you know, the urban farming uh, um, uh, struggle that have contributed immensely in what we call full sovereignty. And Abakani become aware and acknowledge the fact that there's high rate of unemployment in this country and therefore they cannot be uh, going to look for buses and bosses and they have to uh, do something for themselves in order to feed uh, their family. And one alternative, obviously, is to um, have urban lands you know, available for people to start uh, um, do their own farming so that we have uh, food sovereignty. And a lot of discussion has come up around that and why that is important, but also agents, because impoverished people are domed using the, the, the politic of stomach. You know, when one is hungry, um, is likely to consent to everything that you say because they are hungry. So the branch in Ekenan have mastered very well that we cannot be remoted simply because people are hungry because of the deep poverty that exists and therefore um, we must then agree to, you know, everything that, that gets said to us. So hence, um, farming is so important. So this is not only EMST, Abakali is part of a global network uh, called the ESCR, Economic and Social and Cultural Rights Network. Uh, this is a network that has more than 73 um, um, countries um, with more than 300 organization in one network. So we are part of that progressive force in order to forge 
our humanity, but also internationalism and solidarity is key. Uh, we are open to the world and we've seen the world opening to us. And this is what we, we are about to, to, to consolidate, to make sure that there are no boundaries in terms of, of distance and, 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 and geo. Irene, Irene, I think I think we've run out of time. Yeah, I think we I, we have we have more questions, and we really appreciate those submissions. Um, we are going to have to wrap up today, and, and in doing that, I I really want to just express my deep gratitude and appreciation for the generosity of what you've offered and shared with us today, Sabu and Nigel. It is such a, a blessing to be in this space with you. I appreciate those who have joined us and the questions that you've shared and I'm going to find a way to uh, get those and perhaps address them in different ways. If we could all just express our gratitude, thank you so much in closing. Thank you so much. And, and we wish to continue these com conversations and collaborations. And also um, after this event, Nigel will be offering our students a very important opportunity to engage Fanon and the workings of Fanon uh, for our students here at AU. So thank you so much. Please join us next week, our next event in the Thinking Freedom from the Global South, uh, which features Francoise Verger. And that date is up there, May, March 3rd. Thank you everybody and be well.